Thank you, Lisa. And thank you to the speakers and stakeholders, especially uh, for taking the time to come to this webinar and uh, provide us with your insights. Uh, so now let's engage with the audience and our panelists around incorporating the current science into the CDC guidelines. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the panelists to keep your answers relatively brief uh, because we have a lot of questions. We want to get to as many as we can from the audience. And I want to say to the audience, we are definitely doing our best to get to as many questions as we can. And there are a number of ways that you can provide input, which are being reviewed as we go along. Um, I'd like to start with Amber. Uh, and ask you how do healthcare facilities and patient care providers reconcile complying with the OSHA regulations like the respiratory protection and bloodborne pathogen standards, as well as the CDC HICPAC guidelines? And we do have a number of questions around this issue. More simply asked, you know, how do the various agencies uh, rank in terms of the CDC guidelines? Thanks, Kate. Um, it's a really important question. And I just want to start by saying the statements I'm about to make are my opinions um, based on my experience in doing occupational infection prevention for my entire career. Um, so yeah, it's really difficult to be an OSHA compliance or enforcement officer. Um, I've been bullied by healthcare facilities over the years that CDC takes precedent over OSHA. And while OSHA requires hand washing with soap and running water, higher degree of respiratory protection, focus on risk assessment and training, but I will note that CDC focused interventions like patient and source masking, rapid um, diagnostic testing, reprocessing of medical equipment also protect the worker at the bedside, um, giving healthcare workers a little more information and safeguards about pa how patient safety protects them. One other thing um, is that while Department of Labor manages oversight for sick leave and pay, OSHA does not. Um, so they have to rely on Department of Labor, other agencies, and CDC does have the leeway to address those in its recommendations. So not just addressing occupational hazards to ATDs, but the nuts and bolts of managing staff. Last point I'm gonna make is that um, a lot of people say 5A1 um, citations or citations from the general duty clause are a great way for OSHA to enforce CDC guidance. But I did some research just this morning. In the last year, so the last 12 months, there were only 12 general duty clause uh, citations issued in all of healthcare in all states and only 33 in the last five years. So I'm hoping that just in identifying which agency has purview over which element um, that it we can really help to build these bridges between the two agencies um, and incorporate a lot more of CDC's sister agency, which is NIOSH, especially on respiratory protection. Thank you, Amber. Thank you very much. And the next question is for Justin. Can you talk about how you think worker health and safety interacts with patient safety and how the CDC guidelines could better incorporate both of these? Uh, sure, yeah, uh, there's definitely a close interplay between um, patient safety and occupational health. And um, I think um, specifically when it comes to uh, respiratory viruses, um, we do see um, increased um, um, healthcare worker illness during respiratory virus season. Um, and we do see uh, increased um, onset of um, respiratory viruses that are diagnosed in patients while they're in the hospital. So we are definitely concerned that when there are respiratory viruses circulating, that um, uh, uh, people do bring uh, illness to work. Um, uh, while we have sick leave policies that um, uh, ask workers to stay home when they're sick, uh, there is still uh, a culture and uh, pressure to to show up to work and 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 to to put in your 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 shifts so that you don't end up burdening um, your coworkers and. 
And wh while we discourage that, um, we do have to consider the um, human behavior and culture in our society. So with all that in mind, along with the fact that there is a lot of asymptomatic infection that is um, transmissible, um, we do need to think uh, very uh, carefully about um, universal masking policies um, in healthcare settings. And there's been a lot um, discussed uh, back and forth in the literature uh, about um, the benefits and drawbacks of this. Uh, but I think um, CDC and HICPAC, um, it, would, it would be helpful to um, come down with better guidance on when and if um, uh, universal masking should be implemented in the healthcare setting, especially during times of high community transmission. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question I have uh, is probably best for Nancy. Um, Nancy, how important is the prevention of healthcare worker infection and disease in limiting patient infection? Uh, this is a two-part question, and then what are the implications of what HICPAC has proposed on worker and patient safety? Well, as you know, it's very important that, you know, we nurses are protected because when we come to work, if we are not protected, we cannot protect our patients. And with that being said, um, it, you know, it seems that the CDC is really putting profit over patients because what they've been doing is pretty much listening to the, you know, to the employers because the employers have donated a lot of money toward them. So we feel that the HIPAC members are exclusively representing the healthcare corporation. We've seen the CDC prioritized employers' cost consideration over the workers, patient health throughout the COVID pandemic, for example, in, in mid-2020, when it was downgraded by the guidance to allow the hospital to provide nurses with surgical masks instead of N95 for COVID after lobbying by the industry. NNU has led the campaign to get CDC and HIPAC to open up the process to update the infectious control guidance and put from direct healthcare workers in our union. It is essential to crafting robust protective guidance. It is essential that for CDC and HIPAC to engage in the input of direct care nurses or the healthcare workers in our union. We are the one who work on the front line. We are the one who actually implement the infectious control protocol to protect our patients and ourselves. We have essential insight about the implementation. So we need stronger guidance and we need to make sure that our employers are clearly required to implement strong protection, not giving extensive flexibility to prioritize profit over patients, patient care, over safe patient care. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question asking uh, Dr. Milton to clarify uh, one of his slides, which I should be able to do. Uh, basically, uh, I work with him and we put the slides together. And the question is that we need to clarify that his last uh, couple of slides, when he was comparing N95s to surgical masks, cloths and cloth masks and KN95s, was from the standpoint of source control. So he measures exhaled breath uh, when the uh, participant has the mask on. So he's actually measuring what comes out when the mask is on the face. So he that was uh, for source control, not for PPE at that point. Uh, we have a couple of questions here that I think are best for Jane. Um, the questions have to do with uh, the ways that we um, can basically work with CDC, push back, be, you know, participate, engage. Um, one of the first questions is to clarify uh, about CDC's guidelines being recommended practices and not law. That's a really important question. Um, thanks for asking that. So the, the questioner is correct. The CDC does not actually have an enforcement power. Um, all they do is make guidance. That being said, um, the CDC is often treated as the gold standard. And it looks like I might have frozen for a second. Did you catch my answer? Yes. 
I did. Okay. Yeah. I can okay. Still hear great. you. Uh -huh. Just wanted to double check. Um, the CDC guidance is treated as, uh, you know, what what everyone does. Um, the isolation precautions guidance is often referred to as the Bible in infection control, and other agencies incorporate CDC's guidance by reference. Um, OSHA has a history of incorporating CDC's guidance by reference. CMS incorporates CDC's guidance by reference. There are state agencies that do that as well. So I think it's, you know, while the CDC itself doesn't have enforcement powers, um, it's really important to recognize the broad ranging impacts of what the CDC puts together. here. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Amber, if you wanted to add to that uh, as well, or have anything else to add? I, I will. It actually touches on the point that I made at the very outset, which is I've been bullied out of healthcare facilities that have said CDC takes purview, and I do occupational infection prevention for a living. So it gets very difficult, and I'm sure those of you that are in healthcare facilities see it too with this dichotomy of power between industrial hygiene or eh and s and infection prevention and control i think it's time to just blast through all of this long term animosity that the two professions have had each other for each other and really figure out how to build these bridges because the last thing we want is for the worker to become the patient. And in a lot of situations, especially that we've heard with COVID, workers have become patients and it gets very difficult for them to advocate for themselves, for us to advocate for themselves, for ourselves as patients. So we really need to go back to thinking a lot more holistically about facility safety and all the people that are in that facility, especially in healthcare. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that on. And this is a somewhat related question. It might be best for uh, Justin. Um, should the updated guidelines recommend some way that especially vulnerable patients can identify themselves and require that only masked healthcare workers are around them? Um, yeah, that brings up a good point that um, in our <laughs> healthcare facilities, uh, there are some individuals that are particularly vulnerable um, um, and immune compromised. And there are healthcare facilities that have carved out um, tailored infection control measures, um, such as mandating, uh, continuing to mandate universal masking around uh, immune compromised individuals. Um, and, and we do that to a certain extent in our health um, system as well. Um, but I do see a couple of downsides to that, is that, uh, number one, it can be hard to uh, universally identify all of our um, extremely vulnerable patients. And secondly, um, uh, there can be a um, challenge of power dynamics in a patient um, asking or demanding that their uh, healthcare workers uh, mask. Um, I mean, they should, but some people may not feel comfortable with doing that. So I think those factors have to be taken into account whenever we try to carve out um, specialized measures uh, for certain populations. Uh, and, and one way to get around that is during um, higher periods of higher risk, um, just to um, require masking for direct patient care encounters. Thank you. I know this came up uh, with respect to really almost everybody, uh, whether it's your uh, loved one that's in the bed or whether it's your coworker or colleague and the uh, there seem to be people that are not, you know, following the guidelines that a process or maybe something explicit in the guidelines for the best way to do that would help give people kind of permission to say what they need to say. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so we have another uh, a couple of seconds here to add. It seems like we have a lot of questions from the audience wondering more about what they can do, uh, particularly in addition to the uh, information we're passing along about communicating through us and also with the CDC, should we get, uh, should there be more pressure on Congress to get involved and would that help? Maybe that's a question for uh, Jane or for Nancy or any of the panelists. 
Yeah, well, we need to put pressure on the Congress and then NNU has been doing that, um, working together to hold CDC accountable, crafting guidance. And then we have launched a new click to your email action where you could fill out a form and send an email to CDC. Leaders included Director uh, Mandy Cohen. The email urges CDC leaders to release the draft with the end time for public review and hold public meeting and ahead of a vote. So we will put the link in the chat box or you could go to the NNU website at National Nurses United. That org. That's pretty much all the time we have for questions. I greatly appreciate uh, all the questions from the audience and the incredible engagement out there and especially our panelists who took these questions and gave us such insightful answers. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kate.